Hi, I'm Jim Cunningham, and this is Estate Planning 101. These are fundamentals to get started on a living trust. We're going to kind of go back to basics, and we have a lot of people on our webinar here today. And if you're watching this on YouTube, um, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, you can go ahead and click that subscribe button. And you can also post in the comments. For those of you who are watching this uh, live, we are. this is a live webinar, you can go ahead and post your question in the Q&A. By the way, this is a dis uh, disclaimer. I'm a lawyer. I'm talking. This is not legal advice, okay? So don't rely on this to, you know, do a bunch of stuff and say, hey, I saw this gym on video on YouTube. Bad idea, okay? You need to get a professional counseling uh, with a lawyer uh, when it comes to estate planning and, and especially an expert lawyer. So if you have questions, again, go ahead and put those in the Q&A. You can also put them in the comments section. Uh, but I do want to start I, just kind of, you know, when, when you learn something new or maybe you have an estate plan and you're like, you know, I have this thing, I really don't know what, what it says, it's all written in legalese. Uh, I want you to just kind of empty your mind for a moment and just really, you know, sit back, relax. Um, I know this can be a stressful topic because we're talking about death and taxes and, and, you know, stressful things, but really just try and empty your mind. And I want you to think about in, in your life, in our life, what gets us into trouble? You know, what you know, you know, doesn't get you into trouble and what you know, you don't know right? That's pretty easy. Like, I know, I don't know. Okay. But what you don't know, you don't know. All right. Gets you into trouble. This is why it is critical. When you do estate planning, hire a savvy expert lawyer who knows what he or she is doing. The reason is you cannot hire a generalist. This is not a do-it-yourself project. There are too many, frankly, too many booby traps. You can Google stuff. We're surrounded by data. You know, you Google living trust, you're going to get over a billion results. Okay. And we're surrounded by data. But what we really crave are insights. And today I want to give you a little bit of my insights, insights into estate planning and give you a foundation uh, so that when you go meet with a lawyer, you have some background on this and, and you know you can anticipate the questions that are going to be asked, as well as some questions to ask the lawyer. So there are four time periods that we look at that we focus on during estate planning. Uh, there's now, and hopefully everyone is in the now, there is incapacity. What do I mean by incapacity? Typically, I mean mental incapacity. If a person is physically incapacitated, that, that person would be, would be called physically disabled and you know, you're a, a normal functioning um, member of society. It's when you have a cognitive impairment that really we're focusing on. So if you're unable to provide for your basic needs for food, clothing, and shelter, or you're unable to uh, provide, um, or you're unable to make healthcare decisions for yourself. That's what we're talking about. And then there's death. Okay, so what happens when people die? That's typically where you know probate comes in. Certainly at death, probate also comes in during incapacity. We'll talk about that. And then post death, what happens sort of after? You know, after the affairs are wound up, after the child inherits the money, uh, what happens if the child gets a divorce? Is that separate property? Is it community property? What happens in the real world? And we'll talk about that. So. Uh, you may be uh, looking at yourself like this is a big, a big topic. How am I even going to get through this? I'd like to talk about this in the 10 fundamental mistakes, mistakes that people make. It's the basic architecture of, of the book, Savvy Estate Planning, what you need to know before you speak with the right lawyer. And that is available on Amazon. And I wrote that and we have a second edition coming out here in the not too distant future. But I really like to, to start with essentially 10 negative examples. Now you may say, Jim, that's really negative. Can you focus on the positives? But I think if we focus on what not to do, uh, that is very instrumental because these are stories, okay? Fundamentally, these are stories that we'll be discussing. So um, we go back here. So mistake number 10 is letting your family go to probate court. All right, so what is probate? Uh, you probably already heard of probate. It comes from the Latin probare to prove. Basically, when you leave this earth, your stuff does not go with you, all right? Kind of obvious. Someone's left with the stuff. Who gets the stuff? Okay, well, uh, we look at a will. Uh, there, you have a will. You see, you, you see this guy, Bob, here who's passed away. Uh, he did a will. He says, I leave everything to my children. And, uh, but the problem with a will is a will requires a probate judge to say that the will is valid. In the vast majority of contexts, I would say pretty much in every situation with few exceptions, that a will requires action by the probate judge, which means you're going to probate. So if you have a will, you're going to probate. 
It's like the will is the peanut butter and the probate's the jelly. If you want a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you need both. Okay. You're not going to, you can't have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich without jelly. You can't have a, a valid will without a probate court. And the purpose of the probate court is to prove probare, to prove the validity of the underlying will, because we don't know that that's Bob's last will. What if he signed one a week later? What if that's not his signature? Who knows, right? What if this is a complete fabrication? That's the, that is the purpose of probate. A living trust, a revocable living trust, revocable means you can change it, you can amend it. A revocable living trust opts out of the probate court structure. Throughout most states in the United States, people use uh, living trust-based estate plans. People want to stay out of probate. Why? Probate's expensive, okay? A uh, million dollar estate's going to pay over $50,000 in probate fees in California. It gets very expensive very fast. Uh, secondly, it is not a private proceeding. So probate is not a private proceeding. What do I mean by that? Well, anyone, I mean, you can go to any court in the United States and ask for, you know, give me a probate file and they will produce the probate file. And there's a lot of confidential information in there. You know, who inherits what and how much uh, oftentimes is a matter of public record. And I think you can see why you wouldn't want that, that data uh, out in the ether. So how do you create a living trust? So if you say, okay, great, Jim, uh, I know a will's not enough. I've got, you know, my wife and, and three kids. Um, uh, how does this, how mechanically does this work? So what you are the grantor. You're what are called, you're the creator of the trust and the grantor writes up a document. Okay. And um, you can think of a living trust as a bucket, right? So the grantor goes to a lawyer, the lawyer crafts the bucket, hands the bucket to the trustee. So the trustee is, or the grantor has the bucket. And then the grantor puts you put all the property in the bucket. And then you hand that bucket to the trustee. Well, in this case, you are the trustee in a revocable living trust. Most of the time, 99.999% of the time, you are the trustee of your own living trust. Nothing really changes. You sign some documents, you, you put them on the bookshelf or in the safe or wherever you put them. Um, your life doesn't change meaningfully, but you have opted out of the probate process. So it's very important. So you're the creator of the trust. You're also the trustee. While you're alive, you are the beneficiary. So bene comes from Latin meaning good. So you get the goods. Okay, so those assets are held for your benefit. That's how, that's how basically a living trust works. Now, I think a lot of people think all living trusts are the same. They go, well, if I have a living trust, it's the same as every other living trust. Well, uh, it's like this guy who put on this parachute. That's obviously not a parachute. That's a backpack. You need to know, um, you need to make sure that your living trust is appropriate for your situation. And I can tell you, a living, there's no form for a living trust, okay? In, in, the, in the probate code in California, in the laws that govern trusts in the state of California, there is no form uh, trust. There is a form probate, it's called, or form will, it's called the California statutory uh, will. There is a uniform statutory form power of attorney, and there's a, a form for advanced healthcare directive, which is uh, decisions that you would make for your healthcare. Those are statutory forms. You can just lift those out of the code, fill in the blanks, and you're good to go. Living trust, not the same. The point in me telling you that there are these forms is that there is no basic form for living trust. Uh, these are attorney-generated uh, documents. Now, a living trust has to be appropriate for the situation. And this, uh, I think, is a huge mistake that people make. They go, oh, I got one of those living trusts 15 years ago. You need to make sure and keep it up to date because things do change. Who packed your parachute? When you pull this rip cord on this estate plan, what's actually in there? You really should pay attention to it. In our firm, we have a 12-step uh, quality control process, okay? These are all the steps that when a person becomes a client of our firm, you um, there's a learning process, whether it's by a webinar or YouTube, if you're watching this on YouTube. We then, when you, when you reach out to our firm and make an appointment, we ask for a lot of information. And this is really important. So whether you use our firm or another firm, if the lawyer is not asking for detailed information, I would say that's a red flag, okay? Um, a pretty significant red flag because we ask you for a lot of granular detail and any competent lawyer is gonna ask you, you know, tell me about your children. What are their names? What are their dates of birth? Tell me uh, how their marriages are. Right, because we might think about, gee, well, if I leave this property, and my son is, you know, his his ex spouse or his future ex spouse, going to end up with this property. So, 
Um, then there's an attorney meeting with a lawyer. It's not with a paralegal. So we're talking about attorney crafted estate plans. And we, in, in our firm, we have weekly trainings and we actually have monthly trainings where we take out about three hours uh, and train our, our, um, our attorneys on all sort of the latest and greatest uh, estate planning strategies. And then this, um, this plan is reviewed and uh, it's designed by the lawyer. And then we go through some design changes, meet with the client, um, and then um, we meet to sign the documents. And then most importantly uh, in this for you, there's continuing follow-up. So one of the things that we offer in our firm is a free review every three years. Many of our clients take us up on that. Many, unfortunately, don't. Uh, now, what do other law firms do? I can tell you what they do. You meet with the lawyer. They type up some documents in Word. The lawyer looks at it, makes some changes, and you meet with your lawyer to sign the documents. And I don't think that's enough. I think it's really important to learn. I think it's, that's why you're watching this is to learn. Uh, it's also very important to get very detailed information. And we do have a, a question here. Uh, the differences between an AB, Gary asks, what are the differences in an ABC trust versus AB versus others, which is best for different people? Boy, Gary, thank you for asking that because um, we are gonna cover that uh, in a, just a couple of slides. We're going to go over the AB trust, the ABC trust. The whole idea is when your parachute opens, to not to beat the analogy to death, you want a safe uh, landing, right? You want a successful landing, and you do that by hiring a, an expert lawyer who knows what they're doing um, and really takes a deep dive into your situation. So I think we all want successful outcomes. What happens when you're disabled? Now, so... Where, where we are right now, we've talked about the living trust. It's like a bucket. You put your home, your stocks, your bonds, your mutual funds. We'll talk about what you do with your IRAs a little bit later. Uh, but those are your assets. What about you? What happens if you become disabled? And now a lot of people, they think, well, when I die, or you know, it's very common for a spouse, a couple will come and they'll say, all right, if we die in an accident together, then we want the property to go this way. Well, as a lawyer, as an estate planning attorney, I really do focus on incapacity and I will tell you why, because our firm, about half of what we do is we help people after people become incapacitated or pass away. It's actually very common with estate planning uh, law firms. Solo practitioners may be a little bit different. So uh, people who have a one attorney office, but many small uh, boutique firms like our firm, we help people through the incapacity process. Now, what am I talking about? Well, mom and dad, dad has a stroke. Mom doesn't know what to do right? There's all the stuff that you have to do if dad's had a stroke. Well, what if mom dies and then dad's still alive? Then maybe the daughter's coming in. Many times it is the daughter who's coming in to, uh, and then comes to us and says, look, you know, dad had a stroke and mom died. What do I do? Like who makes the healthcare decisions? Who signs the income tax return? These are real issues that people face when they care for an aging parent. Okay. So what, what documents do we use? I can't tell you how many times people come in and they say, Jim, I have my revocable living trust and I'm done. Well, a living trust is just part of a complete estate plan. With a living trust, you should also think about having what we call a pour over will or a will. The will says, even though I said, look, wills and probate, but wills aren't a great thing. This will says, whatever I have in my name when I die, I want it to go to my living trust, okay? if I might've forgotten to put something in the bucket, remember the analogy of the bucket. Well, what if I had a, a rental property in there and I take that rental property out to refinance it, to get a low rate and I forget to put it back in? Well, you would want a will and that's a mechanism to get that property back in the trust so that it's distributed appropriately. So whenever you have a living trust, again, pretty much all the time, if someone has a living trust, they should have a will, right? That, that leaves everything to that living trust. Those two kind of go together. And then for property decisions, uh, that is covered by a durable power of attorney. A durable power of attorney, what that means is it endures after your disability. So a regular power of attorney, uh, if it's not a durable power of attorney, terminates when the person granting the power. So in this case, dad, remember dad who had a stroke, named the wife to sign the tax returns on the durable power of attorney. But then the wife died. So now we look at the document, the durable power of attorney, who's going to sign dad's tax return. And we see that it's the daughter listed on there. If the daughter's not listed on there, we're going to have a problem. 
So one of the things to think about before you go visit with the lawyer to get your estate plan together is who would be making these property decisions for you if you became incapacitated. Now, many times it's the same person uh, that makes the property decisions when you pass away, uh, but sometimes it's not, right? Sometimes it's different. But think about, okay, if I'm married, it's probably going to be my spouse, but not always. There might be a, a, a reason why you would not want to name or could name your spouse, right? If, if, but like the wife here who's husband had a stroke, she's not going to name him, right? So think about having naming somebody to stand in your shoes if you become incapacitated, and then maybe another person, and then maybe another person, right? Because the person you've named, when it comes time to help you out, that person may not be able to do it. That's a durable power of attorney for property. So the durable power of attorney for property is where you name somebody to sign your tax return, deal with your IRAs, your 401ks, your annuities, and your life insurance pick up a registered letter. These are things that happen outside of the living trust. Okay, so it kind of mops everything up outside of the living trust. The advanced healthcare directive or durable power of attorney for healthcare is also another very important document. The durable power of attorney for healthcare is a document that says, if I'm unable to make healthcare decisions for myself, I designate this person to make healthcare decisions for me. And if that person can't do it, the next person and the next person. You also designate people to have access to your medical records. Um, and I'll tell you what, in, in this age of, you know, COVID's on, COVID's off, we're, you know, got a rise in, in uh, infections and, and potential, you know, closing of businesses again, my goodness, I, you know, just lose my mind if that happens, frankly. Um, but, you know, you may not, you may need to access somebody's medical records and, and they may not be able to get to the, the place to get them. So it's very important to, to name somebody who has access to your medical records because you might need a medical record for a particular activity. Uh, you might be getting treated in the hospital and they might need to get those medical records. So very important. That's a HIPAA authorization. Very important to consider having that for your, um, and that's kind of a companion to the advanced healthcare directive. If you're a Kaiser patient, Kaiser typically has their own advanced healthcare directive form. That's about, I think it's 25 pages long and it's different for Northern and Southern California. Um, one, one thing I do wanna to touch on, the average cost of a nursing home in California is over $10,000 a month. Many of our clients who reach out to us, they say, you know, I'm really worried because my mom's living on social security and she has a home. She's been diagnosed with dementia and I'm afraid I might have to move her to a a skilled nursing care facility at some point in the future, how am I going to pay this $10,000? Because that 10,000 is not covered by Medicare. Medicare has a very limited benefit under very limited circumstances, but many of our clients face a $10,000 a month nursing home bill. And there are ways that you can um, write your estate plan so that you can accelerate your qualification for receiving public assistance benefits where the state pays a good chunk of that 10,000 a month. So I won't get too much down in the weeds on this, but that is what we would call elder planning or Medi-Cal planning. But this doesn't just doesn't happen with old people. You know, younger people can have a stroke and you're in a nursing home and you're not coming home and it's 10,000 a month. So uh, I wouldn't just put this in the category of young people uh, or older people. Um, this is something to really consider in your own estate plan is having the tools built into your estate plan so that you have the ability to accelerate your qualification for this very important public benefit, which is basically having the state pay all or part of that $10,000 a month. So how do you pay for long-term care, right? You can self-fund, you can pay out of your pocket, you can get long-term care insurance uh, or the government. And what we were talking about there with the 10,000 is the government. That's a government pay system where you have to be poor. And in California, you have to have less than $2,000 in assets to qualify for public assistance benefits to pay for your nursing home stay. That was the $10,000 a month stay. Many of our clients say, oh, I'm going to self-fund. Uh, Warren Buffett has two policies of, of long-term care insurance. I think that should tell you, I mean, he's a rich guy, right? He has two policies of long-term care insurance. And there's the old way of doing long-term care insurance and the new way. And if you visit our web, our YouTube page, we do have several videos on there uh, concerning long-term care insurance. It used to be that you'd pay 500 a month. And if you used it, great. And if you don't lose it, you're out that 500 a month for the 20 years that you paid it or whatever the time period was. The new way of doing long-term care insurance is to write a single check for $50,000 and get $150,000 in coverage. 
And if you don't use it, your kids get that $50,000 is, is the bottom line. So stated another way, the old way was use it or lose it. You pay monthly every month. The new way is you write a single check. And if you never use that for long-term care, that money ends up going to your, your family when you pass away. So um, uh, it's kind of a way of getting a refund of premium in a sense, uh, if you don't use it, but, but um, that's a more modern way of approaching long-term care insurance. So to recap, a complete estate plan does include the pour over will, does include the durable power of attorney, the advanced healthcare directive, the HIPAA, uh, and there's a, a, and a living will, which says basically, if I'm a goner, pull the plug, um, for lack of a better term. A pulsed farm is a physician's order regarding life-sustaining treatment. Now, the difference between an advanced healthcare directive and a, a, a pulsed form is an advanced healthcare directive is a legal document. It empowers somebody else to make decisions. A pulsed form is a medical order. So that you might have seen the pink sheet. It might be posted on somebody's door. You know, if, um, if the person whose name, who signed this, has a heart attack, do not revive them. And that's typically done uh, with a physician, not with a lawyer. So the pulsed form is done with, with a physician. And by the way, um, advanced healthcare directive, advanced health care directive, those are all, those are all correct uh, under California law. So anonymous asks, what happens to your long-term care premium if you don't use it and you don't have kids? Oh, you give it to another another. So if you don't have kids and you don't use that on the single premium um, long-term care policy, you can give it to whomever you want. I was just using the kids uh, as part of an example. So let's move on to talking about what happens when kids inherit. Okay. What about um, protecting <laughs> your beneficiaries from themselves? So there are two, uh, two big classes of uh, protection. One is if you're, if you are children, right? We're talking about children uh, who, who are under the age of 18. So a child who is under the age of 18, if there is no parent living, then there should be a guardian appointed, at least for the person of the child. So you, I don't know if you ever remember having to sign a, a permission slip for somebody and it says signature of parent or guardian. That's what we're talking about here. Who has the legal authority to let this kid go to camp for a week? right? So when, when the parents, typically when both parents die, that's when a guardianship is needed. If there's a surviving parent, so maybe if you're divorced and you have a minor child, you say, well, I don't want my, my ex-spouse to be appointed guardian. Um, if there's a surviving parent, there's no need for a guardianship, okay? Now, there might be a need for a guardianship uh, if that parent has lost parental rights uh, or if the minor receives more than $5,000. So that's the threshold in California. But in terms of giving permission for treatment for healthcare or giving permission to go on a camping trip, as long as there's a parent living, then there's no requirement for a guardianship. It's also important to think about when naming a guardian, if you do have minor children, if you name a married couple, uh, you know, one of the jobs of a lawyer is to kind of think ahead and, and kind of peek around the corner in the future. If you name a married couple and that married couple's not married, maybe they're divorced, uh, or maybe one spouse has passed away. Uh, if they're not both available and married, uh, you might want to think about, you know, how would that work out? Uh, maybe I should name somebody else or not, but it's just something to be mindful of is to kind of think about if whoever you name, if something changes in the future, it's good to consider that when writing, writing up the documents to address that, that concern. So we have a question, uh, should the guardianship appointment be a separate document or in your trust? The guardian, the appointment of a guardian is state specific. So if you're in California, you can do that in your will. You can also do it. There's a standalone document where you can appoint a guardian. And here's why this is important. Because if the parent, let's say both parents are in an accident and they're on life support for years, you're going to need a guardianship. Your will is not valid until you die. So um, we typically in our firm will put the guardianship nomination in the will that is evidence to a court on, on who the court, uh, who you would want to be your guardian. And it's important to understand that you nominate a guardian. So you designate a successor trustee. You name the person who's going to be successor trustee. And as long as they're not incarcerated or they're over 18, they're going to be trustee. You nominate a guardian. And this is really important. So a guardianship is preceded by a petition uh, for the appointment of a guardian. 
and the court does a background investigation on the proposed guardians. So if you've got a guardian with some shady past, uh, probably not a good person to appoint as guardian, but that will come out. So as we say, everything does see the light of day. So you would want to make sure and put a good person in there. Now, let's set aside the minor, the the minor beneficiaries. And let's just say we got a couple of kids here who uh, the parents say, you know what, if they get an inheritance, they're going to blow it. It's going to be gone in a matter of weeks. How do you protect your beneficiaries from themselves? Well, we have a variety of ways to do that um, on protecting beneficiaries from themselves. And one way is what we call an inheritance protection trust. So an inheritance protection trust is where the money is set aside for the child but somebody else is the trustee, a trusted person. We call that um, a dole it out trust, uh, not inheritance protection trust, a dole it out trust. So we call that a dole it out trust. A dole it out trust is where you name, you know, somebody else as trustee for these two kids, okay, that you see here on the mopeds. You name somebody else as trustee, that trustee is the gatekeeper and they hold on to the money and they dole it out to the children as the trustee sees fit or not. Typically what happens if uh, you have a younger, typically we see this with younger beneficiaries or older beneficiaries. Many times you might have a child who's 60 who just really isn't good with money and this inheritance is gonna be a retirement. Um, what happens in the real world is the beneficiary and the trustee and many times a lawyer, we all sit down and we say, okay, then maybe Sally here who's, who's, um, who needs money monthly. Sally, how much money do you need to live on? Uh, you, there was a million dollar inheritance uh, and, uh, and how's $4,000 a month sound? Oh, that sounds great. That's awesome. Okay, here's 4,000 a month. You basically put them on a budget and so they get that payment once a month. It's not like every time they want money, they have to go back to the trustee. You can set up a budget with a beneficiary. Not protecting beneficiaries from third parties. Okay, this is, a, this is actually a, a big deal and I would put divorce in here as a, as a protection, as, as a thing to protect the inheritance from. So many times uh, people's marriages end in divorce, half of all marriages end in divorce. And what that, what that means is if you inherit property, even though it's separate property in California and in other states, it's probably not marital property treated similarly, it can become community property. It can become marital property very easily. It's very difficult to get property to go from community to separate you, you literally need a written agreement for that. And each party needs their own legal representation, but it's very easy to go from separate property to community property. So all property acquired during marriage in the state of California is community property, except property acquired by, uh, by divorce, except property acquired by gift or inheritance. So the property that's acquired by gift or inheritance is separate property, but it can become community property. I would put a divorcing spouse in the class of third parties. So the vast majority of my clients do not want a future ex-spouse to get their inheritance. I did have one client who said, well, if my son divorced my daughter-in-law, I'd want to disinherit my son because she's a much better person than he is. But that was one out of literally thousands of people. So protecting it from divorce, very, very important. I would say probably 90% of our clients um, end up creating their estate plan in a way where it's protected, designed to be protected from a future divorce. So we have threats and assets and vulnerabilities. The intersection of all of that, of course, is risk. Divorce is, we see as a number one issue and to a lesser extent, lawsuits and, and things like that. But divorce is a big one. So let's look at a case study here. We have, um, we have a, a situation here where Vanessa is, um, is inheriting property. She has a high maintenance spouse, meaning she's got a spouse that likes to spend money, right? Who's gonna be, hey, Vanessa, I want to get another boat. I want to get another truck, right? Um, and she's also a physician. She's in a risky business. She's subject to getting sued quite frequently, okay? Also a second estate tax. She's done well. And if she inherits this property, when Vanessa passes away and it goes to her children, there's going to be uh, another, another death tax. So this is the Inheritance Protection Trust. Uh, many of our clients uh, choose to set up this for their children. So this is the parent, this is Vanessa's parents setting this up so that when the parents die and they leave it to Vanessa, it is in an inheritance protection trust. Vanessa controls this money, all right? There's no third party in there. There's no third party trustee. And instead of inheriting the cash and having it forced into her pockets, the, it's in a trust so that it is protected from 
designed to be protected from divorce and, uh, and creditors from her business. Uh, Anonymous asks, should savings bonds be drafted to owner's name then add POD living trust name? Oh man, savings bonds. Uh, I think there are no more paper savings bonds being issued anymore. That's my understanding. Um, those are uh, kind of a pain in the neck. Uh, I would say without giving you advice on what you should or should not do, one method, and I believe this is uh, rife with problems, is naming the living trust as the POD or payable on death beneficiary. And a problem with that is uh, there is an order of liquidation. If you become incapacitated, there's an order of liquidation on accounts, meaning if, um, if take Vanessa here, if she has a, a living trust and a POD account and a cash account that's just in her, her name, there's a legal order of liquidation. So it's typically the cash account that's just in her name needs to be liquidated first. So uh, I would say POD can, can complicate things. Um, and it's not a good, um, it's not a good way to fund a trust because the trust actually isn't funded. It's not funded until you die. So uh, another uh, case study we have here, Bob Jr. So Bob, remember Bob in the guy who was in the casket, this is his son. Uh, Bob lacks financial experience. He's got a problem marriage. They seem like nice people, but uh, he might be the problem. Uh, he needs inheritance protection, okay? And so what do we do for inheritance protection? We do a dole it out trust. It's a greater protection. So in this case, Bob Jr. here, who's, who's standing there with his wife, uh, is not the trustee. Okay, this is really important. He's not the trustee. Somebody else is the trustee in doling that money up, you know, three, four, five thousand 5,000 a month, whatever the budget is. Eileen asks... If the assets have a beneficiary, they don't need to add it to the living trust, right? And again, that's kind of, I would say, if the assets have a beneficiary, that is a method of funding a trust. The problem is, what if the beneficiary is dead? How are you going to know? How's the beneficiary going to know about that account? Uh, whose job is it? to find the beneficiary and connect the beneficiary with the account. So there are a lot of problems with relying on beneficiary designations. Uh, bank account, a 401k is treated differently. We'll answer that in a little bit, Eileen. You, don't, you do not put a 401k into a living trust. So, and then finally we have Phil. Uh, Phil um, uh, has disabilities and he risks losing his government benefits. So when, uh, if you have a loved one with special needs, uh, you have probably heard of a special needs trust, uh, but if you haven't and you have a loved one with special needs, a special needs trust is designed uh, for the recipient not to get kicked off of public assistance benefits because a lot of these benefits say if you have more than $2,000 in your account at the end of the month, you lose a lot of benefits. You might lose your housing. You might lose your health care. Well, those are suboptimal outcomes. We would want to have Phil's inheritance in a special needs trust. And uh, one thing with any of these continuing trusts, we highly recommend that you consider naming a trust protector in the trust. Now, what is a trust protector? A trust protector is like a superhero. A trust protector is a person who has power over a trust, but is not the trustee. So a trustee must follow the terms of the trust. But what if in following the terms of the trust, you know, the situation's changed and no one thinks that the trustee should follow the terms of the trust because the situation's changed and everyone agrees, you know, well, Phil wasn't disabled when, uh, when, when we named him as beneficiary, but he later became disabled, all right? We, we want to change that trust. And that a trust protector is a person who, can, who is empowered to modify, in many instances, the terms of a trust so that the trustee can follow these modified terms and effectuate the grantor, in this case, you, uh, your intent. So we have another couple of questions here. Eileen asks, uh, we answered that one. Anonymous asks, I'm legally separated and will soon inherit money from the sale of my parents' home. Our husband and me previous trust has not yet been changed in regards to our joint tenancy of our home that we own. Is my separated husband able to claim the proceeds that I inherit? You know, um, Anonymous, this is getting into a little bit of family law, and I would not want to give you legal advice, but I will tell you, if you're married, this is really important to understand. If you're in the middle of a divorce, um, if you're in the middle of a divorce, you're still married. Okay. Now legal separation is different. I'm not a family law attorney, legal separation. You can be legally separated and divide up your property. Um, some people choose, you know, if, if 
maybe you're Catholic and you say, well, we're not going to do, uh, we're not going to get a divorce. We'll do legal separation. Um, but I would say in the context of divorce, if you are still married, you're married and your spouse inherits your property. Uh, your spouse does not inherit your property when you become divorced. So there's a court order that says the spouse is no longer entitled to these assets. The problem is you may have a spouse who's named on an IRA or a 401k. If they show up at the institution, they're going to get the money, right? Because you, so if you get divorced, you need to change your beneficiary designations. A beneficiary designation is the, typically the piece of paper that you give to the IRA or the 401k custodian. And they say, oh, we'll take off your ex and put on your kids. Uh, when it comes to uh, receiving property, uh, again, all property acquired during marriage is community property, property that is um, acquired by divorce, uh, property, property that's acquired by inheritance or gift is separate property. Uh, so on that one, I would defer to your, your family law attorney. Uh, I would suspect that you would want to keep that separate property if you're in the middle of, of a divorce. Yet another reason for an inheritance protection trust, by the way, right? So anonymous in in answering this question, if your parents had set up a trust that was an inheritance protection trust, I would say uh, that is, is not community property, that is your separate property and would remain your separate property. So it's better to have more protection. Uh, irrevocable trust, uh, Anu, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on irrevocable trust in a little bit. Uh, Tammy asks, in the dole it out trust, who would be the best choice for trustee, interested or disinterested trustee? Okay. Great question. Uh, an interested trustee is going to be somebody who is typically the beneficiary. A disinterest, disinterested trustee is somebody who's not the beneficiary. So uh, by definition, it will end up being a disinterested trustee. There's another layer to this. Are they an independent trustee or not an independent trustee? If you're related within two degrees of kinship, so meaning if it's your parents or your descendants or your sibling, that is not an independent trustee, which has some tax consequences. But for our purposes, you could, you know, the parents could name a sibling as a um, as the trustee for another sibling. You know, whether they want to keep tabs on their siblings' assets after their parents are gone is a different question. But um, you know, many times people will choose a private private professional fiduciary or a trust company. Tammy asks, uh, "Okay, I answered that one." So we're going to talk, uh, Anna, we're going to talk about um, but irrevocable trust here in a minute. We're going to touch on those. So um, thinking your living trust covers your IRAs and retirement plans, I think is a really big mistake. And it's part of foundational estate planning. Most of our clients have, um, most of our clients have IRAs, 401ks. And we do, before we get here, we have actually kind of a good question. Uh, Eleanor asks, can the successor trustee set up an inheritance protection trust for the beneficiary son, primarily for asset protection after the death of one of the grantors? The grantors have a disclaimer trust that states any disclaimed assets go to the bypass trust. Eleanor, I would say based on those facts, yes, that's something where certainly you could reach out to us and we can help you with that. Uh, that would be a restatement of trust. So when you have a living trust and you amend the trust, this is really important. When you have a living trust and you amend the trust and then you die, your successor trustee has to send, has to notify everyone that's named in the living trust and the amendment. So if people were in, in the living trust and then out on the amendment, that could be a real problem. One of the things we do in our firm is we really encourage people to do a restatement anytime you touch your trust, okay, on the who gets what side or even trustee side. A restatement of trust is a completely new living trust. You, it's like you, you take a, a piece of property, 123 Main Street, and there's a house on that property. You tear that house down, you build a new one at 123 Main Street. It's a different house, same address. So you don't have to refund your trust, okay? But that's a restatement. Now, living trusts typically do not cover sufficiently um, the, the IRAs 401ks. And I see, I gotta tell you guys something. I, I mean, I, truth be told, And I'm, I do not want to speak ill of my lawyer brethren, lawyers, estate planning lawyers, even expert lawyers do not have sufficient knowledge in this area. I know because I talk to them and they call me. They're like, Jim, I watch your webinar. I have this question. And I'm thinking to myself, that's a pretty basic question. Like you should know that. And I'm not speaking ill of 
my fellow lawyers. I'm just saying, if you're a lawyer watching this, you need to pay a lot, pay a lot more attention to this most likely, okay? Because we, we are giving, in many instances, I would say bad advice. Not our firm, not us, but I think as a profession, uh, we could we could pay a lot more attention to this. So the Secure Act is a real game changer. It so when you hit it used to be when you hit um, seventy and a half, you have to start taking your minimum distributions from your IRA, your IRA or four hundred one k. Now we're not talking about a Roth. Roth is a separate deal. We have a whole bunch of content on our YouTube page on on IRAs. We have a whole webinar on the Secure Act. But here's the basic idea: you have an IRA. Now when you hit seventy two, you have to take out a minimum distribution. You know, four or five percent, whatever it is. Doesn't matter if you have 100,000, a million, 10 million, it's the same percentage that comes out. So an account that's a million dollar account, the minimum distribution is 10 times the size of an account with a $100,000 balance. So a minimum distribution isn't like a minimum amount, like 5,000 that has to come out. It is a percentage amount that is calculated using the last December 31 balance on your, on your um, accounts. And you got to take that money out. Typically, unless it's your first distribution, you got to take that out by uh, the following um, December 31st, okay? So what did the Secure Act change? Well, 87% of the time, when somebody inherits an IRA, what do you think they do? They take all the money out. They don't know. They don't know that if you take money out of an IRA, you gotta pay tax on it. They just, people don't know. 87% of the time, people take that account from what the balance was down to zero. Now. True, there might be a lot of accounts out there with, two, with out there with two thousand dollars in them, so eh, you know probably not worth it to to deal with planning. Uh, but we deal with some pretty big IRAs. You know, I just met with some some clients recently, five million dollar IRA. I met with some other clients with a ten million dollar IRA. Some clients have a five hundred thousand dollar IRA. All these rules apply regardless of size. The rules are the same. So what happens? Well, when you hit seventy two, you have the minimum distribution. When you die, if this IRA goes to somebody other than a spouse. When you die, whoever the beneficiary is, it is highly relevant what their age is and their relationship to you and their health. I am talking about a general rule right now. The Secure, the Secure Act actually made this a lot more complicated. Here's what the Secure Act says. Mom and dad die. The kids inherit the IRAs. Let's say the kids are in their 30s. The kids have to take a minimum distribution the year following the death of the parent. So if the parent died in 2020, kids arguably using that logic would have to take a minimum distribution in 2021. So that being said, um, there, there was a suspension of minimum distribution. So it, it, let's say the, the parents die in, in 2025, the kids are going to have a minimum distribution in 2026. Okay. So what does this mean? How much is it? So the kids don't wait till they're 72. That's very important. The children do not wait until they're 72. The children have to take that distribution out the, day, the year after mom and dad die. Well, how much do they have to take out? It's based on their age. The older you are, the bigger the fraction has to come out. After 10 years, the kids have to take everything out. It all comes out all at once. We used to be able to stretch this out for life. You can still stretch it out for life if your beneficiary is a beneficiary with special needs, is disabled, uh, or chronically ill. And you can stretch them out if your child is a minor and in school. Okay, And minor is defined in California up to age 26, as long as they're in college. Now, how do we keep people from just yanking all the money out? Let's take an example of a $100,000 IRA here. We've got uh, Tom inherits a, a $200,000 IRA, and he takes all the money out. In California, it's going to be a $100,000 tax bill. Here's how you protect the IRA. Many of our clients choose to use IRA legacy trusts. And so what they say is the parent knows, you know, if Tom, who's 18, inherits that $200,000, he's, he's going to take all the money out. How do we keep that from happening? Well, we do an IRA legacy trust. We do not use the living trust. So he will get his required minimum distributions. And after 10 years, he will, uh, all the money will be paid out to him uh, or paid out to the trust and held for him. Okay. So uh, the idea here is, is you are exercising some restraint. Uh, the trustee is because when you die, you leave it here. If the alternative is Tom is named as beneficiary. So if Tom's just named as beneficiary, and Tom inherits the money and he takes all the money out 
he's going to spend that 200,000. He's not even going to think about taxes and he's going to be in the hole a hundred thousand dollars. Not a good outcome. So you have, um, you have a couple choices. Uh, should you leave your IRA to an individual or a living trust? I would say no. I, I really don't like leaving IRAs to living trusts. I do talk to lawyers and they say, oh, well, if you put these provisions in here, everything will be fine. Folks, that is not true. And I know it's not true because I got in a tussle bailing out another lawyer who left everything, the IRA to the living trust um, with the IRS. And it was about a nine month process. It was, it was nuts and it did not have a favorable outcome. So um, the IRA trusts are a solid strategy. In fact, I asked the two lawyers at the IRS, hey, if this was in a, um, an IRA legacy trust, would we be okay? They'd say, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. So there's a right way to do this and a wrong way. But um, the IRA inheritance trust uh, gives you tax bracket management and uh, protection, okay? So you can time the distributions out. You can leave some in the trust. You can distribute some to the beneficiary. There are a lot of strategies uh, that, that you can use. Uh, so we, we recommend that our clients consider that super powerful strategy. If it's a Roth, it's even better if it's a Roth. Okay. So, uh, you guys think the government's going to be raising taxes. It's in the news. They, <laughs> the government wants more. They're not getting enough. I think people have a common belief that, um, if you do your living trust, you're going to avoid a state tax. That is just simply not the case. Uh, Daniel asks, if you have an inherited IRA pre-2010, taking RMDs according to your age and you die, is the beneficiary subject to RMD per their age, your age, or the 10-year rule? Uh, Daniel, this is a great question. So if you have an inherited IRA when you die, my understanding is your beneficiary takes it out based on your uh, life expectancy. I could be wrong on that. That's just a, a legal point. And um, probably a great topic for a webinar is, is how, to, how to deal with an inherited IRA. But, but I'm not quite sure, but that's something we can certainly find out for you. So thinking your living trust is enough is not a, um, is, is a common mistake, right? They say, oh, I put everything in a living trust. I avoid tax. If it were that easy, I'd be doing something else, okay? Um, so what is the tax? What is the death tax? Well, right now, it's July of 2021. It's 40% on amounts over 11.7 million or 23, that was my typo, 23.4 uh, million. Not 24 million, 700,000, but 23.4 million, okay? So there are state death taxes as well. Washington is a state that has death taxes. Oregon is another state that has death taxes, and they're, they're pretty significant needle moving in Washington. It's a little bit over 2 million, anything above a little bit over 2 million is taxed at 20%. In Oregon, anything over a million is taxed at up to 16%. California may have an estate tax in its future. It was proposed in 2019. Uh, this did not get very far even with the Democrat controlled um, you know, assembly and Senate. Um, but it's something that's out there. It's a potential, but you, something you should know is it matters where you end up moving to. So a lot of Californians move to Washington. You need to pay attention to that because you only have a $2 million exemption. So this is a federal exemption, the 11.7 and the 23.4. That's a federal exemption, but there are state death taxes that states are free to impose. Again, Washington's one of them. And, uh, you know, you can Google, does Tennessee have a death tax? I don't think they do. Now, this is, uh, Anu, you asked about um, uh, irrevocable trusts. We had another question about ABC trusts. So I would say back in the day, we used to, as lawyers, um, when I started practicing law, you could leave 600,000 tax-free. Each person could leave 600,000 tax-free. The problem was if a married couple, let's say the husband died and left everything to the wife, if the wife didn't do something to preserve the husband's $600,000 exemption, the $600,000 coupon, it went away. So early on, lawyers figured out, hey, we need to do an AB trust. So an A goes to the alive spouse, the wife in this case, the above ground spouse. The B trust is the buried spouse's half of the money or the below ground spouse's half of the money. So A is the survivor's trust, 
B is the decedent's trust or the exemption trust or the credit shelter trust or the family trust. These are all common names associated with a B trust. The reason we did B trusts was to preserve this $600,000 coupon. Well, then the law changed. And since 2011, the surviving spouse, now the, one, the, the, the wife in this case, who has the A trust, the surviving spouse can inherit her husband's death tax exemption, which isn't 600,000 anymore. It's now 11.7 million. So there's no longer a need in many cases for a B trust. Now, if you're, if the husband and wife or the spouses, husband and husband, wife and wife, or husband and wife are married, you can eliminate this B trust by doing a restatement. Remember I mentioned the restatement before you can, you can say, we're going to restate this trust. We're going to throw away this old AB trust, and we're going to replace it with the new trust that just leaves everything to the surviving spouse. Pretty straightforward. No court involvement. If your spouse has already died and you already have a B trust, or if a parent died and you're stuck with this B trust and you've been doing research and you learn the downside to a B trust, and there is a big downside, a lot of people want to eliminate the B trust. Many times we have to go to court to do that. Why is a B trust bad? Well, if you put assets in a B trust that when dad died were worth 100,000 that are now worth a million and you inherit those assets, you inherit those, that million dollar asset with a $100,000 cost basis. So that means when you go to sell that asset for a million, you have a $900,000 capital gain. That is the Faustian bargain that families made unwittingly with this B trust. So for that reason, a lot of people eliminate the B trust, return everything to mom in this case, so that when mom dies, mom gets an adjusted cost basis on that million dollar asset that was in the B trust. Adjusted cost basis means when mom dies and the kids inherit that million dollar asset and the kids sell that million dollar asset, there's no capital gains tax. Pretty good deal. That's why people avoid a B trust. Um, asset and income protection. There are a lot of strategies. We have a lot of webinars on these. Um, a lot of our clients are doing solar credits, oil and gas. I know it's kind of interesting to put those two together. Uh, trust in other states. Uh, uh, reduce or eliminate capital gains tax using charitable remainder trust, opportunity zones, LLCs for real estate. There's a, there are a lot of ways to protect assets. I would really encourage you to take a look at our YouTube page. Um, and this is really important. Um, the big question for many people is who the heck is going to do all of this, right? When I'm gone, when my spouse is gone, who's going to be my executor? Who's going to be my successor trustee? And Many times people don't know what to do. If they haven't done this before, they don't know what to do. If they have done it before, they know what's ahead. And many people say no. So two things. I would encourage you to talk to the person that you're thinking about naming as your executor or successor trustee. Find out if he or she will do it. And secondly, um, make sure they know what to do. And for, for our clients, what we typically say is, look, if you, know, you become incapacitated or pass away, tell the person to just call our office, right? Reach out to us. We'll go over the situation and we can give them guidance. But you do need to name somebody who is also trustworthy because there's no court oversight. People ask me, Jim, what is like the number one downside to a living trust? I would say one of the number one downsides is no court supervision, okay? The problem with court supervision, it's probate. But really, if a trustee goes off the rails, um, in many trusts, there's no mechanism to fire the trustee and remove them. And you know, this happens, doesn't happen a whole lot, but it does happen. A trust protector many times can be empowered to remove a bad trustee. So that, that would be the trust protector is a person named in the trust who can remove a bad trustee. So that's something to think about as you're setting this up, especially if you have a continuing trust, you're not quite sure who might be trustee in the future, right? Because people could die. And these trusts can go on for a long time. So there should be some, some basic structures in there. Of how, do you, how do you name a trustee if somebody stops being trustee and there are no trustees left, right? Or what if a trustee goes bad? Uh, these are things to all to think about. Lola asks, how do you find a trustworthy professional fiduciary in Placer County as a widow with children far away? Need this service if I become disabled. Thank you. Uh, the California has a California Professional Fiduciaries Bureau. Uh, it's a website. If you Google California 
Professional Fiduciary Bureau, I think that's what it's called. You can scroll down and look at, at fiduciaries by county, but Lola, Lola, you could certainly reach out to our office uh, and we can give you kind of a short list of people that, that we're familiar with. Um, mistake number two is not keeping up with changes. Uh, I would say the thing that changes most is the family situation, the assets situation. Um, as we age, the change accelerates. As we age, the change accelerates. Think about that. The older you get, you now you have grandkids, great grandkids, and they're going to school and they're going to college and getting married and things start happening, uh, it seems, at an accelerating rate. But I would also say check in and, and you know, how often should you look at your estate plan? Every three years, we recommend. That's a really solid strategy. The older you are, potentially even more frequently than three years. Um, our firm, we have a lifetime estate planning process. We do flat fees for living trusts um, and uh, webinars, ton of webinars, YouTube content, really big proponents on education. Um, you know, uh, this is kind of a COVID, kind of grew out of COVID, but we just um, really, uh, really try and, and educate our clients and friends on, on these really important issues. Uh, so I would say the number one mistake, and you are have successfully avoided this mistake because you're watching this is procrastination. This is overwhelming for a lot of people. I get it. Like, where do I start? I'm talking about my own mortality. I'm talking about these really difficult issues. You know, it, it starts with just making that initial contact with our firm uh, or another reputable lawyer, but you know, our firm, you're watching this webinar put on by us. We offer um, uh, free uh, consultations to our clients and people who are not our clients, we have a slightly different process, but um, we make it easy. So you have to make an appointment and you have to show up. Now, many of our appointments are done by Zoom, okay? So many of them are Zoom appointments now, and uh, many of them are in-person appointments, and we have offices in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, Southern California, and the Capital Region. Uh, but uh, I would really recommend that you subscribe to our YouTube page. This is a great way to stay informed, stay up, up to date. And if you would like an appointment, you can go to our website and click request an appointment and you can, uh, somebody will, will connect with you and get you set up to meet with uh, one of the many attorneys in our firm. And so if you guys have any questions, I will just open it up in the last couple of minutes to any questions that you guys might have. But I wanna thank you for watching today and we'll give it a couple of minutes to see if anyone has any questions. All right. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks for attending. And I guess that's a wrap. Go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube page and we look forward to seeing you soon.